So anyway, tonight's speaker series guest is Alvaro Jaramillo, who uh, I think probably everyone here has heard of. Maybe many of you have been on his trips overseas or on the water. And uh, I know I've been on many of his pelagic trips. I haven't yet gone on, a, on an overseas trip, but I look forward to that particularly, I don't know, uh, well, maybe Galapagos or something. We'll just keep that and we can talk about that later. <laughs> Love to go to the Galapagos. Um, so he is a world known authority on all things birds. Uh, he is the, he literally, quite literally wrote the book on our icterids, the blackbirds. And we, I think we may have a copy of this at our bookshop. This is out of print, I believe, but, but I have a copy here. <clears throat> He's also written um, The Birds of Chile which is his home country, a uh, fabulous book, um, a remarkable uh, diversity of, of birds in that country. And I think quite recently he wrote uh, The Field Guide to Birds of California. So this is a photo guide uh, with Brian Small, photos by Brian Small. And uh, I think we've had copies of this in our nature shop as well. <clears throat> so he's a prolific author. He's a world uh, bird uh, guide. He's the founder of Alvaro's Adventures. He's on the lecture circuit, obviously, for decades. <clears throat> He's been a casual and accessible um, force in uh, on Penbird, which is where I first learned of him and started to talk to him. Um, he's easy to he's easy to get to know, and he's fun to talk to, and he is probably the most wonderful pelagic guide I've ever been with, and I'd say probably one of the best guides, bar none, land or sea. Uh, because of his willingness to answer questions and explain things um, in the, the most gentle way. Uh, he's got the sharpest eyes and uh, just endless, endless knowledge. So <clears throat> I did miss the short-tailed albatross, and I, I, I won't hold that against you, Alvaro, but I'm hoping that that'll, I'll have another opportunity at some point. So with no further ado, I want to welcome Alvaro. Thank you for being here, everybody. And thank you, Alvaro, for talking to us tonight. And whenever you're ready, you can take it away. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. I'm kind of, you know, the lighting is probably poor here. You can't see that I'm blushing, you know? It's, it's, <laughs> uh, I mean, so a lot of those things are over so many years, but to have it all compressed into one little segment and, you know, boy, I started getting, I, you know, stressed from being so busy. <laughs> but, but uh yeah i mean recently i've been doing a lot of trips uh offshore you know the last few years that's been sort of one of the my main um type of tour that i've been doing so i'm going to talk to you about that i'm going to start sharing the screen here um and we can get right into it um so the um the idea here is i'm going to talk to you about pelagic birding in california but also give you sort of a, a little mini virtual tour of what a Farallon Island trip is like. And, um, and then as I, as I go through, I'll, I'll explain what the difference is between a sort of a, an offshore pelagic trip versus a Farallon Island trip. And um, also give you an idea of, of what it's like, uh, what you should do to prepare, what you should be thinking about if you, especially if you've never been on a pelagic birding boat. Um, the let's see i gotta click on this first and then we can get going but first of all you know you have to realize that we live on the most misnamed planet anywhere right we're we're planet earth but we're mostly water and most of the water is full of stuff that uh to, to us still some of it is you know as little known as as mars you know to get down to the bottom of the oceans or to get out deep in the ocean so Venturing into the ocean may seem like a radical thing as a birder, but in fact, it's actually getting you to see what much of the birding surface of the world looks like. And it's not always gentle like this. It can be um, difficult. You know, we're not set up in you know the, to to really sort of uh, enjoy the ocean as easily as it, it you know it, it could be if we had bigger boats or different types of situations. So we, we go out there and we try to see as many seabirds, whales, um, mola mola, ocean sunfish, jellyfish, all of these things that are out there and try to learn a little bit about, about them, also talk about them and figure out also if we're seeing anything unusual. 
But, you know, so here's a gull, ringbill gull on the beach. And uh, you might say, okay, well, that's a seabird, right? I mean, and, you know, in some ways, terns, um, pelicans, cormorants, they're, they're all seabirds. They, they take, um, you know, I mean, gulls usually are called seagulls, right, by most people. They, they use the ocean uh, to a varying extent, but there are some birds that are truly, truly oceanic. So the real seabirds, let's call them that, and we call them the pelagic birds. Pelagic being a word that means offshore. So offshore birds are often ones that you only see from shore very rarely or when they're nesting. And, and often these birds nest in places that are hard to get to, like islands or in the Arctic or in the Antarctic. So the way to see them is to go on a boat and, and try to get a look at a Sabin's gull or a Forkdale storm petrel. Um, and one of the things that we, we also take for granted is that pelagic birds are actually everywhere. So these, each one of these colors is a different pelagic bird individual that's been tracked by various systems of, uh, you know, sort of satellite tracking. And you can get the sense that they really range all over the place, highly mobile, and much of that part of the world we, we really don't have access to. I mean, really, who has birded here, right? Very few people. Uh, and, but we do have access to the, the coast here in California, and that, that's where I'll be um, taking you, really. And there are various reasons why California is truly special for seabirds. It is one of the best places for pelagic birding on Earth, right? So there you know, might be the humble current. You might think about South Africa, New Zealand, Australian currents, but California is right up there with them. And uh, the reason is ocean productivity. In fact, the California current system is considered the second most productive current system on Earth. And that means like biologically productive in terms of zooplankton, phytoplankton, and all that stuff that's going on to pro provide food for all of the higher ups in the food chain from whales to storm petrels. So we have the current systems, we have this uh, continental shelf edge where sort of the continent, there's a shelf around the continent that's kind of flat and then suddenly the water just drops off in depth. We have these canyons and deep water that are relatively close to shore when you compare to other parts of the world. And we have islands like the Farallon Islands so we have a lot of things going uh, for us here as far as, as birding the offshore waters. And this is what the Farallons can look like. They've, um, one of their names, the old names is the devil's teeth because they look like just scary teeth sticking out of the water. And they can be menacing and sort of, you know, really eerie kind of place to visit. And then other times it just seems like, you know, such a colorful, vibrant, um, place and it all depends on lighting and fog and so forth and you can kind of already get a sense for what it's like you know you're on a, a 55 to 60 foot boat out there and you're sharing the railing space with other birders and it could be 20 to 30 people depending on you know also the number of spotters on board that are on the boat and uh, as far as the Farallon Islands Southeast Farallon the big one um, we we move all around look and 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 look for birds and nesting things and mammals, but we can't actually land on the island for various reasons. One of them being that only biologists and Coast Guard are allowed to, to land on there. But uh, we do get actually quite close and, and can see a lot of things really well. But again, you know, it all depends on what the weather is like. Sometimes the islands are just uh, um, truly uh, gorgeous in, in a menacing, almost, uh, you know, sinister way that uh, that is, 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 you know, I think really kind of special. Uh, so if you see the islands in different days, they're almost like a different personality. You go there and there in the breeding season, there are hundreds of thousands of breeding seabirds. So some of these birds that are hard to see sometimes right from shore, although common mers you can see from shore often in numbers, you can get to see them, you know, in, in just thousands and often um, just really, really close to the boat. The um, two island groups that are most important for seabirds in California are the Fairlawns and also the Channel Islands down south. I'm not going to talk about the Channel Islands. In this talk, I'll talk about offshore birds, give you an introduction about some of the offshore birds and also some of the ecology of our current system, as well as 
sort of what birds are on the Fairlands. But this gives you an idea of um, the numbers of birds and the importance of, of the Fairlands to, to breeding seabirds. So it is in the US, on the west coast of the US, it's the most important seabird island south of Alaska, right? And there are hundreds of thousands of seabirds there. Most of them are common MERS, yet uh, even common species like Western gull, it's the largest colony in the world of Western gulls. And most of the world's ashy storm petrels, and I'm saying, you know, more than 50% of the breeding population of ashy storm petrels nest on the island. Ironically, they come in and out at night, so you don't see them on the island. Often you see them a little, if you're lucky, uh, sort of after visiting the islands in a little offshore deeper water that we go visit. The uh, even things that, you know, you might, say, well, I see those from the coast and so forth, like Pigeon Guillemot. If you go to Pigeon Point, for example, or, you know, Año Nuevo, you can see Pigeon Guillemot relatively easily, even, even in Half Moon Bay here. But over there, it's the largest colony we have in California, Pigeon Guillemots. And you get really great looks. And often in, you know, in the August season, also a lot of juveniles, which are interesting to see. So there's a lot to see, and this is just the birds. The marine mammals are also a real show, and I can show you a little bit about that in a sec. So we go out in boats like this. This is the new Captain Pete out of um, Half Moon Bay, and they're fishing boats that also do tourism and whale watching and birding and so forth. So they they know how we how we do these things, and they try to keep us safe in terms of letting us know when weather's just not going to be possible to go somewhere and so forth. So they really um, really great uh, with, with us, you know, as, and, and really like birders uh, when we get, get out with, with the local boats. And there are other boats we use from other ports. But um, if you're thinking of a typical pelagic trip, this is sort of what it looks like. We would go out from Half Moon Bay and we kind of wander out to this shelf edge right here, go into the deeper water canyons. Depending on the weather, we may go further out or we may go further south and eventually roll back to, to the to port the islands themselves are further north. So then in that case, we're gonna be going further north. And uh, this gives you an idea of, of how to get to the islands. So if we're here in Half Moon Bay, we go out and then we head up northwest to the islands. Then we go to this deeper water area down here um, at the continental shelf edge. And then we can sort of go down getting closer to port as we visit these deeper water areas until we have to cut back in and go back. Um, we're also this year trying out uh, a boat. Um, we did it last year from South Salido that we will be going out this way uh, to the islands. Um, the, the issue about you know, distance, it's actually kind of almost the same distance to get to the islands from either South Salido or Half Moon Bay, but um, there's a little bit more time inside here where you are in, in, the, um, in the bay in more sheltered waters. Yet um, from Half Moon Bay, you have, assuming the weather's good and we can get to the deeper water, we have more time in deeper water before we come in as opposed to the South Salido boat. So it, it, there's pluses and minuses for each kind of boat. Um, but rest assured that no matter what, it's, it's a ways out. It's nearly 30 miles to get to to the Fairlands and sometimes the boat can only go 10 knots. So you might be, or maybe sometimes a little more, two and a half hours, two hours to three hours, depending on the boat to get out to the island. So it's a, it's a trip, it's a full day trip. And from above, this is what it looks like. And we tend to visit if, assuming the weather's good, Southeast Fairland Islands will go all the way around. And we tend to start up here in a place called Sugarloaf. And I'll show you that in a second. But it, it's um, it's the big island southeast Farallon, the one that you know you sort of um, that really makes uh, where, where most of the birds are. There are other islands in the in the chain, but we don't visit them because they're further out and they don't have nearly as much stuff to see. Now, in terms of weather, it just varies day to day. Now, this real calm photo down here is actually Morro Bay, but the weather can be choppy or it can be calm. Uh, and you just don't know, and we can't predict, we can't say this month is the month when it's always calm because it's here, could be Saturday's calm and Sunday's not, you know, this is the way it is. And uh, you just sort of take a chance and see, see how things are gonna be. We never go out when it is truly rough and the captain makes a call 
as to uh, whether we, we can't go that day. Um, for example, now it's super windy right now. We had a, a trip planned out on, on, on Saturday. We can't go. It's just going to be too windy to get out there. So unfortunately, that happens. You're at the whim of, of the winds and the waves. And uh, uh, fortunately, we have people, the, the crew that are, you know, it's, they let us know when things are just not, not right. And we trust them. And they know what we're interested in. So for the here's Matthew looking at the islands. Um, and I thought I'd tell you a little bit about birding from a boat, how it works, and also how to prepare seasickness, all those questions that people have. There are different boats that go out there. This is another one we, we haven't used, um, but the Salty Lady is the Oceanic Society. They um, they go on the Salty Lady often out to the Farallons and roughly um, that kind of size boat, single hull in most cases, sometimes are catamarans. Uh, you tend to want to be outside on a boat because that's where you're going to see things. That's when you're in the fresh air. And that is where there's also less likely, um, in my experience, that you will, you will feel seasick. If you're inside, some people, the, the confined nature of cabins and the movement actually make it worse. So I always say, you know, be outside. and. Um, we do have information, like I said, we know that we have buoys out, out there that we can look at online and see what the, the wind is like and what the waves are like. And, and the changes can be drastic. I mean, for example, in this, in this situation here, there was basically no wind on this day. And just a couple of, you know, through a couple of days, it went to an amazing 26 knots and waves that were, you know, 12 feet high from essentially, you know, almost zero. So it, it can happen over a couple of days and the prediction we have is really quite good now in terms of when the wind's gonna pick up and, or when it's gonna subside. So uh, fortunately, we're, it's, it's easier now to know what's coming uh, as opposed to even 15 years ago, 10 years ago. Um, this is a picture they took of a boat on the Mavericks, you know, when the Mavericks um, surf uh, contest was going and they were actually filming for the Mavericks movie, Chasing Mavericks, and they got, into a situation they probably shouldn't have gotten. So this is not a birding situation. This is exactly what you want to avoid is having anything like this happen. But uh, it's, a, it's an interesting picture of a boat that we used to use before it moved up north in California. The Huli Cat's no longer around here. But what you need to know is about wind and what we know and what we sort of transfer then the info to you, swell heights and how space the swells are. So you can have a small wave, a smaller wave that is closely spaced and that is choppy. That same wave height, if it's more distantly spaced, it's really smooth and rounded and you won't even notice. So, um, and the cancellation is always really the captain that calls it and just says, you know, um, it just can't, it's not gonna work. The one of the most unpredictable things offshore is fog. And you, even in today's you know, world with all this data we have, knowing exactly when a fog bank is going to form or not is really, really hard to do. So you can go and have a day where half the day is bright sun and half the day is in fog, and you just uh, never know. Um, and one good thing about fog is that fog tends to form when there's very little wind. So if you have a foggy day, you it's not going to be a super choppy day. So there's, again, always good and bad. Um, I always tell people, try to celebrate after the pelagic, not before. So I would say, you know, avoid drinking any, any wine or so the night before, no alcohol. Prioritize trying to get a good sleep. It, it, it's, there's trepidation often, so people don't get a wonderful sleep before a boat trip. Either they're very excited, they're a little nervous, but try to get sleep. Because if you're well rested, that tends to be the best way to avoid any seasickness. And I like to eat things along, you know, in the trip, um, crackers and so forth, drink water, sunscreen. Like I said, avoid going into the cabin. One uh, good tip is to always be looking for whales and birds outside and look at the horizon. Uh, and the horizon kind of settles the way your brain is interacting with the movement of the boat. And that makes you feel like, you know, everything's under control. What happens is when your brain mismatches essentially the movement uh, of that it's feeling with what it's seeing, that it, it really, that's when you sort of get the seasickness issue. But if in doubt, take medication and there are some medications that are, you know, 
over-the-counter, some medications that are prescription, and you can ask your doctor about that. Um, you know, the one they call the patch. So if you've ever seen people with a little patch, that's that's what it is. And a little bit, you know, show you birds as I go along. And then, you know, as I, also as I talked about some of the ecology, here's one of the quests when you're offshore is to try to see an albatross. We fortunately live in an area where black-footed albatross is relatively common. And often when you get into the right situation, you will see them. And um, in this uh, graphic here of, of, you know, tracked albatrosses from, you know, other parts of, from Hawaii probably, you'll find, you'll see this bright red area right here between Cordell Bank and Monterey was one of the highest densities of usage by black-footed albatrosses. So we really live in a place that is very good for black-footed albatross. So if you get out to the deep water, you have good weather and um, you have luck, you will, you know, have a super high chance of finding a black-footed albatross. It's not guaranteed, but um, they're out there. And um, every so often, the rarer Lazan albatross shows up and they're becoming more and more common. There's a colony of Lazans that nests in, in Mexico on Guadalupe Island, and that colony is growing really quickly. And we, it seems like those birds are coming up here during the spring, summer. So we are seeing more and more Lazan albatrosses to the point now that, you know, um, I think there was a record number seen by folks in uh, Cordell, well, not Cordell Bank, but in, you know, just north of there this spring uh, on one day. I think it was seven, seven of them. So, and, um, the, the part of the reason these birds are here, as I mentioned, is this California current system. And um, if you look at California here, it's this current that moves from north to south. And it's essentially a conveyor belt bringing cold, nutrient-rich water. So nutrients, generally cold water, is richer in food and oxygen. And uh, it's bringing that from the north to the south. Then we have, especially when we, in the spring, when we have all that movement of uh, wind pushing the water and exactly what's happening right now, we get the upwelling. And upwelling is when the wind pushes the water out and then water from the bottom then comes to replace that, that water that's been pushed by the wind. And you get, again, cold, nutrient-rich water coming from the bottom to the top. So we have two methods of getting nutrients up to where the sun is. And uh, that's when all the bloom happens of plankton. And then, you know, before you know it, you have all these little critters in there and then ashy storm petrels and whales can feast on that. So that's sort of roughly how it works. And you get what we call, you know, swarms or, or schools of bait. And bait are any, anything that's small, edible, that is usually in a concentration. So it could be anchovy, sardine, market squid, or krill, there's multiple, and I'm simplifying, there's multiple species of krill. There's also um, juvenile rockfish. There are other things, not just the ones I mentioned, but um, they kind of peak in the summer into the early fall. And that's when we have the peaks of whales and birds. So that's the best season to be out there is that summer into the fall. And one of the things that you might not have ever thought about with all of these crit critters in the ocean is that they have a daily migration, they actually come up to the surface or near the surface every night, and then they sink down towards the bottom every day. So this is actually a time series of readings of densities of food in the water column. And you can see here when all this food kind of goes up towards the surface, which is up here, uh, and then fills up the surface, that's nighttime. And then down it goes for the day, and then in the day it's all down at the bottom. And if you think about it, this is the largest migration of any living things on earth. And it happens every day all over the world. So, um, the, you know, think about that. So a lot of these birds and whales and so forth are feeding at night too on, on these, these creatures, yet we are watching them in the day. So we're only getting half of the story. We um, have on the boats um, sonar, you know, that can look down into the depth. So this is 400 feet of water depth right here. And all of this red stuff is food. So it's a column here of nearly 400 feet of food. And just try to imagine that, you know, how much life there is. And when you get this kind of density, you often have whales and shearwaters and all sorts of other things in there. 
I'm, we also can get data from satellites on water temperature and chlorophyll. Chlorophyll tells you where the productivity is happening. And all of that helps us to sort of figure out where we're going to see all these birds. And um, we also need to shout out uh, to the uh, marine sanctuaries. We have a series of marine sanctuaries here. Um, you know, we have the Gulf of the Farallons, we have Cordell Bank, and we have uh, Monterey Bay. And Monterey Bay stretches all the way up to our latitude up here. And these marine sanctuaries are, you know, there's things you can and cannot do and stuff that they also measure and, and track and also, you know, create um, possibilities for minimizing issues like, you know, uh, entanglement of, on, of whales and all that kind of stuff. So the marine sanctuaries are really important in terms of why we have so much wildlife here. They're like a national park that's helping us protect the, the critters that are out there. But back to the Fairlands. So here's the Fairlands. I mentioned Sugarloaf. It's this little bit over here towards the north and, um, and west and east. And Sugarloaf looks like, you know, a big kind of mountain coming out of the, the water. And that's where we look for tufted puffin. It's one of the best places to actually get good views of tufted puffins. And this is the southernmost colony of tufted puffins in, in California. Well, actually, perhaps in the entire Pacific. And so they're there and there's several hundred of them. We might see, you know, 20, 30 in, in any one trip, maybe sometimes more, but there are a few hundred. So they're not in the thousands, but they're, they're there in good numbers. And fortunately, they, they um, often will swim right next to the boats and give you um, their sort of unique uh, look. They're really kind of cool birds. Sea parrots is one of the old names that some of the sailors used to call them because there are puffins also in the east in the Atlantic. And I think that one was the one they used to call the sea parrot. But we see tufted puffins. Very rarely do we see a horn puffin. Um, one of the things that's happened in the last decade is that boobies will show up on the fair lawns. Brown booby, this is a male of the sort of uh, Baja California with the white head uh, form of uh, brown booby. They've been showing up. And sometimes, you know, you can see multiple of them here sitting on sugar loaf. Um, with a puffin here and boobies, you know, who knew that puffins and boobies would ever see each other meet on the same cliff, but this happens now. It's due to the fact that the ocean's changing and uh, water is getting warmer and we are having a northward movement of some of these birds that used to be incredibly rare in, in California. Now they're regular. Brown booby is one of them. Um, 2013 was when we had a movement of blue-footed boobies and they stuck around for a while. Brown boobies have, have showed up. Nazca boobies are actually becoming much more regular now. And we even had a, a year that, uh, a year and a half or so where red-footed boobies were showing up here and there. So this would have been unprecedented. You know, 30 years ago, if you had asked anybody, you think we'll ever see boobies around here? They would have said, absolutely not. Those are tropical birds. But now with changes in the ocean, we are seeing them. On the other hand, we see some regularly occurring uh, creatures from the north that get to like the, like the puffins, um, but also whales and, and other um, mammals. One of them that we get often nice views of in, on the Fairlands is stellar sea lion. And you maybe have seen lots of California sea lions and stellars is big. Um, and uh, what stands out sometimes is how pale they are. They're not always, color is not always the best thing, but they have a big head and really dark noses and really dark flippers. And they can be really, really huge. And when you see them next to um, California's here is a Stellar's, two Stellar's and then two California's to give you an idea of the differences in their faces, how much broader, bigger the heads are of the Stellar sea lion. So they breed on on the Fairlands, as do California sea lions and, you know, harbor seals, as well as um, northern fur seals, which I'll show you in a bit. And the Fairlands are a national wildlife refuge. You cannot actually, like I said, on a trip, go and visit. You have to be a biologist or somebody, you know, who's, who's doing work out there to do that. And here's, you know, a view of sort of the east side uh, of, of the island and see these coves are actually uh, some of the best places see stellar sea lions along with a lot of um, 
California sea, lion, sea lions and all of these cliffs are full of murs if you were up close to them. There are big sea caves in the islands and even some of the biggest ones have murs that breed inside of these arches. Um, you probably, you know, have heard some people, non birders say, oh, yeah, they're walking on the beach and they saw what looked like an injured penguin. And you, as a birder, might say, well, no, you know, you should call, uh, you know, bird rescue folks, but um, if it's oiled or what have you, but that's not a penguin, that's a mer. Well, turns out that they actually were kind of right because the original bird called the penguin was the great auk. And the great auk is now extinct. It was a flightless relative of the mer, and it was called the penguin. And when sailors that knew the penguin went down south to the southern hemisphere and saw these other black and white flightless birds, they called them penguins. But in fact, the real penguin was a relative of the mer. So it's a miss, you know, now we don't have the real penguin. And so anytime you see a penguin, you can think, well, that's not the real penguin. These are fake penguins, but uh, <laughs> enjoy them nonetheless. And yeah, and if you do find a mer um, uh, oiled or, or something like that, do make sure, you know, you phone somebody that can go and take care of it, International Bird Rescue or a local group that can um, care for it. Um, common mers are there, like I said, all over the cliffs by the thousands, they lay one egg and they place it very carefully in, in a little, you know, little safe spot. If you've ever seen a mer egg, it's very triangular. So they roll really tightly so they don't fall off the cliff. Mers um, in the breeding season have a dark head. And then in the non-breeding season, they have sort of this teardrop on a white face. They, um, they start molting out of their black heads in September and that August, September time frame is also when you see the MERS with their little kids. And you can tell the youngsters um, are youngsters because they're half the size or actually sometimes much smaller than, than the adult. They leave the nests before they can fly and they swim tens, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 miles from the colony and still hang out with their dad. Their dad is the one that takes care of them. At that point in time, the female's done. She's, you know, um, she produced that egg, she, all this energy that she spent also doing much of the incubation that she leaves to go fatten up and then molt and then dad has to take care of the young. But if you see uh, a, on, in Half Moon Bay, a little myrrh being, you know, uh, following a dad, it's, it swam there. It didn't fly there. So it's, it swam 30 miles maybe to get to that spot where you see it. Um, the islands have two houses. One is the biologist's house and one is um, the Coast Guard house. So the biologists from Point Blue will stay at one of these houses and they do have in the shelter these trees. This is the Farallon National Forest, they call it. And that's where a lot of the rare warblers and so forth that you hear about that show up in the fall and the Farallon show up in these trees. Sometimes they're elsewhere in the island and um, you can even look at the, the Farallon cam uh, you can log into that and, you know, if you there in the in the fall, you can sometimes see lost migrant birds that are that show up in the camera that's up on top of the mountain. The, um, like I said, the um, largest colony of Western gulls in the world is on the Fairlands and they banned every every uh, a series of of individuals every year with a color code that tells you which year they were banded in. So this is interesting because if you know the codes see these colored bands you can actually tell how old each gull is and that allows you to sort of learn a little bit about gull plumages and the immature stages or sometimes i think i found one that was like 15 16 years old so um also just track how long some of these birds live when you're out there you'll see some other breeding birds uh cass and zocklet some of the best views I've ever had of cats and zocklets have all been near the Fairlands. This one was a juvenile, right, right around the islands, for example. When they're old, they get white eyes. You can tell this is a juvenile because it has dark eyes. And cats and zocklets eat krill. They like krill, that's their preferred food. And often when there's a lot of cats and zocklets, it might mean there's blue whales around as well because blue whales eat krill as, as well. And the trip to the Fairlands, if it's the right year and there's a lot of krill, might be a good um, trip to see a blue whale. 
so far this year, I think there's actually good krill numbers offshore. So we'll see if the blue whales um, show up in numbers this year. And like I said, the pigeon guillemots nest there, you can see them on in the harbor near Half Moon Bay, but also if you go there in the right time of year, late August into early September, you'll see these juvenile birds that are kind of really, really different. So salt and pepper look to, compared to the, the adults. Um, if you, hopefully you see this uh, animation. These are Southeast Farallon Islands banded and tracked individual pigeon guillemots. And what you'll see is they, they're coming down to the island, that point right there, that's April, that's May, that's roughly right now, they're all nesting on the island. Then in August, September, they all move north. So this is actually showing you that our breeding pigeon guillemots actually winter to the north and they winter in sheltered waters of fjords up north of uh, Vancouver Island. So that's really weird to think of a bird that goes north in winter. <laughs> So now we have all that info. There's been a lot of work, all sorts of biological work done on multiple birds on the Farallons, like rhinoceros oclets as well. And with the oclets, there are also projects where they've created nesting burrows for them where they can breed safely and, and, uh, and sort of that's helped to increase their, their ability to raise enough young for the next generation. So this is rhin rhinoceros oclet. Often we just yell out rhino when we see them. And in this picture, you can see why they're called rhinoceros. They have that, that horn right on, on top of the bill, which is a display function. They lose that to some extent in the winter. You'll see cormorants um, out there. And that's interesting to me in that they, cormorants are not offshore creatures, but they, you will see them sometimes crossing to the Farallons. And there's a good number of brants, especially breeding out there, a few pelagics. And, and double crested. So when you're nearing the islands, that's you start seeing more and more cormorants. If it's a foggy day, if you start seeing cormorants, you know you're getting close to the islands because they don't like to be in the sort of offshore water. And um, storm petrels are particularly important in in the Farallons. And as, as I said, you you don't see them there often because they come in at night. Um, and um, the one that is the most uh, sort of um, critical is the ashy storm petrel in that this one is essentially, it's a California current endemic. It means it's only found in our region of the world and most of them breed on the Farallon Islands. And there's not that many of them. It's thought there's 13,000 ashy storm petrels and that's it. They are all dark, yet they have sort of a gray rump, a little gray wash to the back and these pale areas on the, the underwing, that's how you identify them. Also the flight style. But um, you might have heard about the, it was kind of controversial for a bit, the mouse eradication program that was going to be happening on the Farallon Islands. And in primarily, this is being done to get rid of introduced house mice that attract burrowing owls in the winter. And then those burrowing owls actually eat ashy storm petrels. So this is an unnatural situation that's happening due to the introduced mice. And there's all sorts of other negatives that the mice uh, create, including eating endemic uh, plants and so forth. So the idea is if you get rid of the mice, the burrowing owls won't come, ashy storm petrels won't have a local predator. So that's what's gonna be happening in the near future, I guess, uh, next couple of years that they're doing that. So if you've heard of that, you can, um, you can look, look it up. Um, the Farallons are famous too for the great white shark population. Unfortunately, seeing a great white shark event is super rare. Um, even if you go there in October, which is the time when it happens most, you know, most of the shark attacks on, uh, on um, seals and um, sea lions happen then. But uh, I actually saw it once. This is a picture of it, um, a shark attacking a, a um, sea lion. And it was in October. And it was just super lucky that the, the shark actually came up and we were able to see it. Often these attacks happen underwater. So the only thing that shows up is a blood stain and birds that come down to feed on that. Yet, uh, so um, it, it happens and it's one of the most famous places for sharks. It is actually very difficult to see that. And it doesn't overlap much with the birding season to tell you the truth. By October, there's very few birds on the Fairlands and we're doing more offshore trips. Um, Here's a, another mammal that you will see out there that 
often it's hard to see um, uh, just a regular pelagic or sometimes, you know, it's your hit and miss is the northern fur seal. And they're like, um, you know, they're like a small sea lion with, a, with almost like a little rat-like face, very different, really long whiskers. Everything they have is long, long ears, long flippers. And there's a growing colony of northern fur seals. And it'll be interesting to see what happens because in the past, northern fur seal was the most common mammal before they were hunted by, you know, in, in the 1800s, I guess it was, um, before they were hunted for their furs, that was the most common mammal on the Farallon Islands. So they're picking up steam uh, after being gone for a while. They actually re returned to the islands and have been increasing. There's more images of the island. And um, <clears throat> lastly, I'll give you sort of a rundown of sort of some of the birds you see on these uh, boat trips, like phalaropes, red phalarope, redneck phalarope, one of them bigger, grayer, the other one's smaller and, and um, a little darker. In the spring, they actually look a little different. Red phalarope actually looks red with a white cheek. Redneck phalarope has that red right around the neck. And these are females. The males are less brightly colored than, than the females. And I'll tell you a little story about redneck phalaropes elsewhere in the world in the Shetlands, a place that you might know because of the Shetland ponies, if you've ever heard of them. Well, in the Shetlands are way up north in Scotland, almost between Scotland and Norway. Um, so they're sort of, you know, subarctic, and they have a lot of redneck phalaropes breeding there. And they were doing studies on them, um, banding them and putting little geolocators on them. So when they come back the next year, you can extract the data from these little machines and figure out where these birds had gone. And believe it or not, what they found is that these birds from way up here north of Scotland migrated to North America went down the East Coast, crossed Central America and wintered near the Galapagos Islands. So they're actually wintering in an entirely different ocean system than where they breed. It was always sort of assumed they went down to Africa, but they don't. They actually go to Galapagos, believe it or not. So we don't know where ours go, where they're going. They're probably also going to Galapagos and they're breeding in, in Alaska and some of them in Siberia. We have all sorts of different pelagic birds. I mentioned albatrosses and storm petrels and the alcids, but there are other things out there. Shearwaters, like the sooty shearwater, this is the most common. And they're out there getting that bait, that bait fish, whatever it might be that's in density, that's what they concentrate on. And when they're here in numbers, they're here in densities. You know, you can see 10,000, 20,000, sometimes even more, yeah, when, depending on the year, how much food there is. And Sudi shearwaters do these, these um, really long um, flights all in figure eights all across the ocean. So they visit, they might be breeding in New Zealand or breeding in Chile, and then they come here to California for part of the time. They may go to Japan. To them, the ocean's just one big playground. And uh, they can go from here to New Zealand in less than 20 days, just sort of straight doing a little foraging here and there, but just move, move every day and get through that quickly. Um, there are other species of shearwaters from like the pink-footed from Chile, the bullers from New Zealand, and other species that can show up. Each one of them has its different flight style, size, water type that they like. Um, and um, our standards really tend to be sooty and pink-footed, then the other ones show up at various other times of the year. Uh, and some are less common than others. We can also be looking for storm petrel flocks and um, storm petrels are really the hit and miss birds. Sometimes you will see one or two flying up and they're actually very small, very hard to get a good look at at times. And other times there's big flocks of them, thousands all sitting together. And when you get the big flocks, some, sometimes it can be like ashes in there and then fork tails and Black storm petrels, here's the one with a white rump, that's a Wilson storm petrel. They can all be together. And uh, we are, we've just um, applied for a permit to be able to use attractants like you know, squid and so on. So essentially chum to bring birds in in the sanctuary. And if it's the reason we're trying to do this, apart from seeing the birds well, is to try to facilitate finding storm petrel flocks and documenting storm petrel flocks, where they are, how many there are, what species there are, because these are, this is a real conservation concern for 
storm petrels in particular, um, ashy. But I just wanted to mention that here's two species, the uh, forktail storm petrel that we can see kind of grayish with a dark, darker underwing. Um, and um, this is a, a Wilson's with a white rump, dark brown thing. Now we, we've found through genetics that these two types of storm petrels are two different families of birds. So even though um, they look very similar, the, the Wilson's group they are now calling southern storm petrels since they all tend to breed in the southern hemisphere and the other ones um, northern storm petrels. But we can see both of them on a boat trip here. Um, prizes for us are all the merlets from the south. We, if we see any, it'll be scripses, this one. Sometimes we have, depending on the year, we've seen creveries and the super rare one that has shown up a few times is Guadalupe with the white around the face. So these are birds that we see when the water's calm, when the water's warm, when we're offshore. And um, certainly they're all, we're always looking for them, but they can be tough to find. The three species of Jaegers, on the other hand, and the skua, the South Polar skuas, are not necessarily difficult to find. They're just difficult to identify. The three Jaegers, they can kind of come in small, medium, large, and small is the long tail, medium parasitic, uh, Pomerane being the large. And they don't always look nice and clean like this. There's immatures and all that. So it's difficult identifications. Sabin's gull, uh, very hard to see from shore, but sometimes there are, you know, flocks of 10, 20 offshore, depending on the year. And there's truly beautiful. And we're lucky in that when they're migrating south, they still, they don't still have their black head. So they look just like they do when they're breeding in the Arctic. And then we can see these sort of scaly, fine looking juveniles with black on the tail as well as they, when they head south. Like the Jaegers, the turns are really difficult identifications. Yet with photography, and sometimes if they sit still enough for us, we can see both common and Arctic turns on a trip. And um, Arctic turns are, are sort of the, the longest distance migrants that are known right now in the earth. Uh, the next one, it's sort of the next uh, in, in that championship of long migration is sooty shearwater. So we can see both of the two most migratory birds on earth on one birding trip, which is kind of neat to ponder. And of course, sometimes it's just loaded with humpback whales. Other times they're just moving, but if they're foraging, if there's a lot of food, it can be spectacular. And it's fortunate that where the whales are, often there's a lot of shear waters and we will see some other stuff with them. So there's, it's not just birds or whales, you're often doing both of them at the same time. And unique, interesting um, species of, of smaller cetaceans. My favorite is the Northern right whale dolphin. This one without a dorsal fin that looks really, really slim, almost can look like a sea lion when it, when it goes through. And then sometimes just hundreds of Pacific white sided, sometimes thousands of common dolphins. So it, it can just be, you know, it, you never know what the day is going to bring. And that's one of the fun things about going offshore. It's totally unpredictable. And you can sometimes have these wilderness experiences that you just cannot imagine um, exist, maybe just 20 miles from a big city, but they do. Um, and um, you know, lastly, in terms of sort of the ecology of these birds, how do these birds find food? Uh, well, for many of them, albatross, the shearwaters, uh, storm petrels, they actually uh, smell for their food. They're kind of like turkey vultures and they have very keen, keen sense of, of smell and they're clued, in, clued into specific chemicals that tell them that there's biological stuff there, food. Um, and there, the ability to, to find these, uh, this sort of food is so um, precise that some albatrosses can find a morsel of food that they can smell a couple of miles away, just to give you an idea. And if, if that's, it's a big enough morsel of food, it might be even further. So, and it also depends on the wind and so forth. And um, one of the weird things that, um, you know, a group that you don't think of as having sort of a keen sense of smell are the alcids. And this is, a, this is a species that's not found around here, but the crested auklet and whiskered auklets, their islands where they breed in Alaska and in Siberia are, 
often smell of, or of, of a kind of citrus. You know, one of them smells a little bit more like a tangerine, the other one like an orange. And it, it, it's a chemical called oct octolol. And that chemical is not only used it's the, the birds use it to actually as a display in a sense that they, the females and males are attracted to the chemical and attracted to the smell of the other individual that's emanating this smell. And it's also a tick repellent and, and sort of a, a cleansing agent in a sense. So um, there's a whole lot of stuff that, you know, it's probably we're just scratching the surface of understanding smell in birds and particularly in seabirds. Um, so there you go. That's, you know, a bit of seabirding, Farallons, why California is special and thinking about coming back to the port harbor here in Pillar Point. And even then we can be seeing interesting things right to the last moment, such as marbled merlets. And um, thank you. Um, obviously a lot of whales, birds, things I didn't show you because there's only so much time. And as, as you can imagine, I, I can talk forever about this stuff. So I had to, I have to stop somewhere. Al, <laughs> so, brother, thank you. You, you uh, crammed in a lot of great information there. And it was pretty wonderful. So um, there are going to be some questions coming in through chats. Uh, but while they're kind of um, gathering, uh, I have a couple myself just to kind of get things started, give people some time to, to post their questions in chat. But You've been, uh, you founded Alvaro's Adventures when, what year? It's about 10 years ago. Okay, yeah. so you've been, yeah. you've been doing really focused pelagic trips out of Half Moon Bay for at least that long. Um, yeah. And so you've had some time to notice some trends or anything. And even though it's a short period of time in the, in the you know, geological sense, maybe you've noticed some, some changes in those 10 years that you could opine on. Yeah. Um, you know, and before I started, I also was, you know, doing uh, various other uh, trips all the way back, you know, Big Sur, when Big Sur Ornithological Labs was was around, I, I, I guess Big Sur, yeah, um, I, that was my first trip that I ever did in California. And then since then, um, you know, there's some things that happen that are periodic things, right, like a warm water year, the El Nino's, and it goes back and you think, and you almost have to like try to disassociate some of those periodic things with with through longer term trends. One thing that I've found, I've thought, you know, and, and it's there's data on this. Humpback whales are much more common than they used to be, even 20 years ago. And they there's they used to really be concentrated a lot around, you know, sort of the two areas, you know, the Farallon, offshore from Farallons and Monterey, but now they're, they can be thick in Half Moon Bay and elsewhere. So I, I've noticed that. I've, I've noticed that some, some marine mammals have been increasing, like you, you see the numbers of, of um, fur seals on the island. Then on the other hand, um, uh, a book, Dull's Porpoise, I used to think of Dolls Porpoise, the black and white one that I might have, uh, maybe it's in here somewhere. This is the one here, nice and black and white, very fast, the fastest of, of the marine mammals out there. They used to be the one I thought was the most common standard. You'd see it, saw them all the time. I don't see them that often anymore. And I think I think they're cold water associated mm -hmm. and they, they're not here as much anymore. So there, there's some elements of, um, the whales have come back just because they're they're doing well and you know they've been protected and it's been enough time post whaling, um, but other things are are changing because of I would say climate change and it's the climate change happening on the ocean which is warming oceans and um, moving of creatures to the north so maybe some cold water associates we don't see as often as we used to. Some warmer water associates we're seeing more often like boobies. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's changing. Um, and um, that warm water blob situation that happened for a few years, that was really scary. I got to tell you, yeah. Matthew, you were out there yeah. during those times. Sure. It, it, was, it was weird. I mean, we, we had stuff that was happening that nobody had ever seen before. And then 
then it sort of went back to normal for a bit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I have, a, I have one more question before we uh, go to the audience questions, but um, we've had really dry conditions for a bunch of years in a row now uh, on land dry conditions. And I'm wondering if you uh, have any sense of how that's going to affect uh, pelagic birds, if at all. Um, I, I think, I think there's some, there's probably higher level um, connections that, that might not be so obvious. Perhaps we think of the dryness now as high pressure zones that are more stable over inland areas. Likely that high pressure zone is causing wind. Um, you know, so there's these connections maybe I don't know clear enough, but like this year just seems so dry in the interior and throughout the winter, and it's also so windy. Um, I wonder if that will be a net benefit or not to the to the California current system, because I mentioned that whole idea of of, of upwelling. Mm -hmm. If it's it's one of these things that scientists actually called it a Goldilocks system, there are things that be just be right, you know, for it to work. Mm -hmm. And if you have too much wind, what happens is the the food gets moved to the offshore area and it's further away from where the nesting birds are. So I wonder if there could be a situation where you think about, oh, there's a lot of wind, there's gonna be a lot of upwelling. And that's true, but maybe it's being transported so far out that it's not good for the local breeders. Mm -hmm. Maybe, I don't know. So there's a lot of things that people at NOAA, at, in the marine sanctuaries, at Point Blue, Oikonos, so these organizations, you know, that are working on this are are trying to sort out how you know how the the environment is changing. So fortunately, sure we do have a lot of science power here. Everybody's probably on high alert, watching for any yeah. potential effects of, of these yeah. extremely dry conditions. And we go from year to year, El Nino, La Nina. Um, are we heading into uh, a, one of those conditions this coming uh, pelagic season? We are in uh, La Nina condition as far as the the sort of the area that's um, the prime Nino area is really the Galapagos. That's where sort of uh, that area and the northern Peruvian current where things really show up. So it's La Nina there. That means it's colder than normal. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the connections to California are sometimes much more direct if it's a larger Nino Nina. If it's a smaller one, the connections are less so, but it can affect rainfall the next season and so forth. And people are still, you know, there's supercomputers churning through all that much. And my brain's not, you know, I get confused. <laughs> yeah, of to, course. Which is good, which was bad, which was the good one, which was the bad, you know, but so, it uh, seems like. <laughs> yeah, it, it looks like we have quite a few questions. And so maybe Carolyn, can you, uh, can you feed uh, Alvaro some questions? Yeah. Um, so from Julie, uh, how is the mirror population this year? Um, she recalls reading about, sorry, um, there being very few common mirror in the recent years. Oh, no, they've, they've been going up. Uh, actually, they've, they've, they're a bird that's been doing quite well in the Farallons. And because they live so long, um, they can have years where even there's good mortality rates and you see them on the beach and all these things are troubling. Um, but because they live so long, they can kind of catch up to those negatives or even if they have a bad breeding year. Um, but their numbers have actually been increasing in, in the fair ones, at, at least here. I can't talk about Alaska elsewhere. We, so they're, they're doing well here. Yeah. Great. Uh, from Bob, uh, what predators do the pelagic birds have? What the predators? Um, I would say that when they're when they're offshore, they have very little to fear, um, but much of their predation happens in the breeding areas. So if you're an Arctic species, like a Jaeger, and you're nesting, you, you know, could be a fox or something up there. Um, if you're an island breeding species, you know, like a sooty shearwater, it could be an introduced mouse. Um, that is your main predator. So introduced rodents are really, really problematic for nesting seabirds on islands. And this is why groups like, you know, island conservation, one of their primary goals is to eliminate introduced mammals from islands. 
because they they're there's they're often the major predator of stuff that's big even like albatrosses you know so it's uh that's the concern so but at sea they have very little and once you an albatross is fleet you know flying free they they have very low mortality rates other than things that we do like fishing <laughs> so, yeah. yeah probably a great deal of the, the plastic waste as well yeah especially when nesting yeah yeah um, from Bill, he asks, uh, how did the burrowing owls manage to find the mice on the islands or, or end up on the islands to begin with? Um, burrowing owls are really migratory, the northern ones. So we, they're sort of like a stealth migrant. We don't notice that they're coming into a, the Bay Area in, in many places. We, we have them in coastal San Mateo County, for example, in using badger burrows and other burrows that now, you know, with camera traps and so forth, we're realizing there's all these burrowing owls coming in, but nobody kind of saw them. So it's it's like a stealth migration. They've always kind of been going through, but they wouldn't stay on the islands if it wasn't for the mice. They would just maybe do a little hop there, go, oh, there's no food, go back to the coast. So that's what, what's going on. Very migratory, yeah. Shorty owls too, actually. Awesome. Uh, from Ginger, can you comment on the recent pelican illnesses in Southern and Central California? Um, yeah, there's, so there, the pelicans are, something's going on. Um, it's unclear what it is right now, but there are different age classes involved. So they're finding pelicans kind of wandering around, you know, places they shouldn't be or getting even hit by cars. Um, the, the rehab centers are full of pelicans. And it could, it, it could be a major food issue that's, that's happening, that they're just not finding the type of fish that they need to survive. But it's not just juveniles, it's actually some old, uh, second year birds and adults, and that's key. If, if you had a really great breeding season for pelicans and they've sort of, um, there's too many, no, I wouldn't say too many, but you know, sort of it's a natural process. Sometimes they do really well and, there's just so many of them that they're bound to to have a mortality that's kind of a natural from from that big bloom of in, of juveniles that you find just juvenile mortality. In this case, it's not just juveniles. So it's something a little bit broader than that. It's it's not just a good breeding season, and I, it's still being sorted out. But it might be fish stock um, and that that bait fish, and that can go up and down for various reasons. Yeah. <laughs> Very complicated then. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and then from Alice, uh, so what are what are the impacts from pollution and, and plastic waste? Um, um, plastics are, you know, are really uh, complicated because they we think of the, the class, those pictures of, you know, the albatross chick with all the plastic and it died in, you know, midway or so forth. But a lot of plastics are microplastics that are out there that are, I mean, they're even in the krill, you know, they're, they're pervasive. And that, that element of those almost invisible plastics, I think it's less known and maybe more worrisome because they're much more pervasive in, in the water column. And there's some work being done to figure out where the plastics are coming from. And um, one of the issues that might be a problem is from clothing, actually. It's not, you know, bottles or that, that is always the problem, but it's all the fibers from plastic, you know, a lot of plastic in our clothing, probably in our fleeces, you know, so that there's ongoing work and, and, to figure out what what is happening, but it's 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 a uh, we think of the big plastics, but it's the little plastics that might be more damaging, and we don't know how or where they're coming from. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I don't want to you know bum people out though. But it's what's happening. <laughs> hard hard not to be bummed out about microplastics. Yeah. Um, well, that clears the the questions in the chat. Um. um Wonderful. Thank you, um, Carolyn, for doing that. So Carolyn uh, will probably be joining me on uh, the pelagic trip. We have. All right. Yeah. So I think that'll be your first one, Carolyn. Is that yeah. Right? 
Yeah, so yeah, I'm excited. We're uh, we're really hoping that we'll find Puffin on that day. And I see you've got in your closing slide here the short-tailed albatross, which I think you just put in yeah. there to bum me out. But. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So everybody, we are going to have a uh, an SCVAS at Alvaro Adventures uh, pelagic trip on July 16th. And uh, if you can't make that one, uh, there'll be other people on the boat, not just not just Santa Clara Valley, but I'm sure Sequoia and San Francisco people will be there as well. But we're all friends. Uh, but uh, we're setting this one aside as a special um, SCVAS trip and are hoping that you're going to be there. I'll be there. Carolyn will be there. I think uh, Barry and Ginger will be there. We're hoping to get a lot of Audubon people there. But if you can't make that one, any of Alvaro's trips are worthwhile. Um, and I like the ones out of Half Moon Bay because it's close to home. It's an easy ride. And like you said, you get offshore in the deeper water uh, more quickly than you can elsewhere. The Farallone trips are a fantastic destination with something actually to see. As in, instead of just water with underwater features. So it's exciting and fun. And all of his tips on uh, on how to avoid seasickness are, are worth listening to. But uh, love to see you on any of his trips. I've been on many as a, uh, even as a spotter. I've, I've enjoyed meeting people and welcoming Audubon members. So um, I'm glad to have that opportunity. And Alvaro, I'm so glad you spoke with us tonight, and this was an incredibly wonderful talk. And uh, just want to thank you for that and uh, spending your evening with us. And uh, is there anything else yeah. that you'd like to close with before we say our goodbyes for the night? Um, you know, um, it's, I think uh, you can, uh, the ocean is just can be so unbelievable. And I think I hyped it up of course and, and just keep in mind that it's just like any other birding trip you do sometimes it's you know expectation sometimes beats expectation sometimes it's lower and uh it, it and also it's seasonal so there there's things that you see early in the season others that are more common late in the season so keep in mind that on one trip if this is like this is my pelagic trip this year don't expect it to be everything that I've mentioned today <laughs> because you know you will be sorely you know disappointed or you might say it's just like you said um, but uh, uh, just keep that in mind it's like any other natural experience uh, it, 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 uh, it changes every day and you just never know and sometimes you hopefully if you like it you can come back at a different time and see some different things so yeah that is so true I mean I've been out there on occasion and had days I simply could not believe uh, just wondrous magical experience with dolphins and sea turtles and whales and birds from all over the hemisphere um, and then other days less so you just never know and that's what kind of makes it exciting and mysterious yeah uh, and uh, really fun I think for yeah. birders um, so with that I think we'll close up but I, I wanted to mention that I did mention it before but I'll be giving a, a presentation through Stanford continuing studies a week from today um, uh, beginning at noon to one it's free uh, you're welcome to to join me for that that'll be through the content uh, Stanford continuing studies site and it's on bird migration so um, anyway thank you so much Alvaro and thank you everybody for attending tonight the recording should be available tomorrow if you've missed any part of it or you'd like to watch it again It'll be there. Um, everybody have a wonderful evening. And Alvaro, thank you again. We'll see you shortly on the water. All right. Good night, everybody. Night.